James chapter 1 as we continue through James. James chapter 1. We're going to pick up in verse 18. James is the practical preacher, and last week we looked at working through trials, and this week we're going to look at working through temptation. Working through temptation. We're going to pick up in verse 13 if you want to stand to honor the word of God this morning. James chapter 1. Picking up in verse 13, the word of God declares, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Let's pray one more time. Holy Spirit, we thank you for the word of the living God, and it is a living word. We pray, Lord, that our roots would go downward into the word and our lives would bear fruit upward to the glory of God and the glory of our King, Jesus Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' precious Amen. Amen. Thank you. In his best-selling book, the Closing of the American Mind. Professor Alan Bloom spoke of asking his undergraduate class at the University of Chicago to identify an evil person. That's the question to the university. Can you identify an evil person? And guess what happened? Not a single one of them could identify is that? Because there is a new religion in America. There is a new religion in our country. And it's called relativism. What is relativism? Oh, if it's right for you, it's right for you. If it's right for you, it's right for you. If it's right for me, it's right for me. We really don't have any right or wrong. It's whatever you do, want to do in your own do it. As long as you're not hurting anybody, it's all good. That has just pervaded our culture. You want proof? Just look out the TV. Look out the door of your window, or look out the window. What do we see in the past couple weeks, just lately on the news? And I'm not political. This pulpit will not be used for politics, but what happened last week? New York City, the Pride Parade. This was the, these were the words that were spoken at the Pride Parade. We are here. We are queer. We're coming for your children. And quote. Friends, do you see what has happened here? We went from tolerating to now we're taking this thing over. It went from tolerance to takeover. And when someone says a words like those, you know what that is? That is a, can we just be raw this morning about this? That is a homo-fascist regime. And they're coming to take over is what they're trying to sell you. Friends, James tells us this morning, there is good and there is evil and each one of us will be tempted to do evil. So James goes from external trials to internal trials this morning. A couple things about temptations. If you're a note taker, James is going to talk about the cause of the temptation. We're going to look at a little bit of the cycle, briefly at the cycle of temptation. And then he's going to give us the cure for temptation. The cause, the cycle, and the cure. Okay? What's the cause of temptation? Verse 13. Look down there if you have your Bible open. I pray that you keep it open because we're just going to go through this thing systematically this morning. He says, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God. 
For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Again, James is very practical. What does he say about temptation? He says, number one, he says, you can't blame anybody except yourself. He says, don't look to God and blame God because God, there is no evil in God. There is no darkness in God. God is completely holy. He's completely just. He's completely right. There's no evil in God. So don't blame God for your temptation. Okay? And he says also, don't blame the devil. What's the temptation? What is temptation? We hear that word. Anybody here ever been defeated by temptation? Am I, am I the only one? Okay. I, I've been defeated by temptation here. But what is temptation? A good definition of temptation. It is simply this. A solicitation to do evil. A solicitation to What's the purpose? To shortcut or short-circuit your spiritual development, to get you outside of God's perfect will for your life. That is the temptation. God has given us boundaries, okay? And the temptation is, would you please just take a step out of that boundary line for a moment? That's the, that's the temptation, to get you to go outside of God's boundary just for a split second. Even if you just put one foot over here, that's the temptation, now, as we looked at James chapter 1, we saw trials, and now we see temptations. Literally, if you look at a Greek text of this, it is the same exact word. Trial and temptation is the same word. And you say, what's the difference between a trial and the temptation? The difference is this. The source, the purpose, and the outcome. The source, where did it come from? The purpose of it, where, where is this leading, what is this to do, and what's the outcome of this? And again, oftentimes the context will reveal, again, which word is used. I want to show you how this works. A trial can be used at the same time as a temptation, okay? Follow this with me, church. A trial can be used by God and exploited by Satan simultaneously. Used by God, but exploited by Satan simultaneously. God may be using a trial right now in your life to develop you. That's what we said last week, right? He uses trials to develop us. But at the same time, Satan can be using it to destroy you. Let me give you one example. Job. We're studying Job on Wednesday evenings. Where does Job find himself? In both situations, God is testing Job, okay? Have you considered my servant Job? There's a test. His faith is on trial. Now Satan comes in, and he's throwing all kinds of things at Job. Boils, death to his children. You know the story, okay? So where is Job? He's in the crosshairs of a trial and a temptation all at the same time. Satan, God is testing his faith to see if he's true. Satan's saying, will you, Job, please just step out of the box and curse God? That's what, you see how that works, church? They can be both at the same time. So what does James say? You can't blame God. You, want to think, you don't think the Bible's relative. You listen to people outside. You even listen to people in the church. What do they say? God made me this way. I was made this way. He created me like this, right? Isn't that the argument today? And when that argument comes forth, I just agree with people. Yeah, God has made us that way. He has made us all sinners. That's what he's made us. We are all sinners, and we all have this fallen nature, and my flesh wants to do all kinds of strange things and, and pursue all kinds of different pursuits. So, again, he says, God, you know, he, said, he says, don't you blame God. God did not make you that way. What happened in the, what happened in the garden? What did Adam do? Uh, he sinned, right? And what God came to him and he said, and Adam said, it was the woman that you gave me. He didn't blame the woman. He was blaming God. God, you gave me that woman. Therefore, God, it's your fault. 
And then what did Eve do? No, no, no. It's the serpent's fault. The devil made me do it. How many times have you ever heard that situation? Oh, the devil made me do it. James says, no, 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 no. Scratch all that from the plate. God didn't make you do it. The devil didn't make you do it. So what happens? Okay, so let's look here. He gets into the cycle now of this temptation. What causes temptation in our life? James gives us two sources. Number one, the first source is an internal desire. Internal desire, verse 14. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires. By what church? His own desires. Own desires. The word there is lust. His own lust. You can lust for good things. You can lust after God. That's a good lust. To lust after God, to lust after his kingdom. But you can also lust after bad things, and we know that. And here's the thing, church. We live in a fallen world. And that means not all our desires are evil, but all of our desires, listen carefully, have the capacity to be evil. Let me give you an example. Sleep. Everybody desires sleep, right? We, want, we need sleep. But if I want too much sleep, what does that make me? Lazy, right? Food. You know the analogy, right? Food is good. We need food. If I eat too much food, we got a glut problem. And again, we can go down the map with all kinds of different things, sex and all the other things. Note there, though, James says, each one, each one. Each one is tempted. That means, listen, my temptation, what's tempting for me may not be tempting for you. And what's tempting for you may not be really appealing to me. You know, if someone puts, you know, leaves a, a stack of money over here, for some reason someone just left us some money in the church, I'm probably not going to be real tempted to, to just grab that up. But if someone is really a money person, they're going to want, hey, I'm going to take that money and just, I didn't see anybody, you know? Again, each temptation is different. Our different personalities, our different likes, our different dislikes, our different desires. What's the purpose? It says to draw you away. What's the, he wants to draw you away from the place of security. Back in the Garden of Eden, what happened? Satan tempted Adam and Eve to go. God had this umbrella of protection on them. And Satan said, why don't you just come out from that umbrella of protection just for a moment? Because this fruit looks so good. It looks so pleasing to the eye. Would you just play outside the box just for a second? So there's an internal desire here happening. Second thing, he says, there's an external deception. Verse 14, at the end of verse 14, this is probably one of the most important words here. Enticed. Enticed. Circle that word and put baited, Lord. okay? Again, there's a huge fishing illustration here. This is what James is talking about. There's a hook here. Have you ever heard, why do people always say they're hooked on alcohol? They're hooked on drugs. They're hooked on pornography. pornography. Why are hookers called hookers? Hmm? Because there's a hook behind it, okay? And that hook has one purpose and one purpose only, and that's to take that thing and reel it in, and we got you now, okay? I wish a fisher, I, I wish Thad was here because I'd pick on Thad. Uh, I don't, I'm sure there's another fisherman out there, big fisherman out there. Ron, I know Ronnie fishes. I'll pick on Ronnie. Ronnie, if you go out to the lake today and you just throw a metal hook into the lake, how many fish you catch in the day? Probably none. Ronnie said probably zero fish on just a metal hook, okay? Now, let's get, bus let's get down to business. You put a shiny, flashy, spinning lure that looks really attractive on that, and you hide the hook, and then you drop that thing into the water, and you got a hungry fish somewhere down in the water. Oh, boy, then we're talking, right? What's going to happen? That fish is going to be drawn out from its safe place, Probably it's a little hole wherever it's hiding, and it's going to take that bait, and what's going to happen? That hook is going into the jaw, 
and you're getting reeled in. You see how that worked? The fish wants to eat. It's hungry. It has an internal desire. The bait looks really attractive. It's going to satisfy my needs. It's going to satisfy my wants. It's going to make me happy. And guess what? Boom. Bite. You just gave in to the temptation. Okay? When internal desire intersects with the external bait, you have temptation winning. You can have desire with no opportunity, you're good. You can have bait, no desire, you're good. Let me show you how this works in real life. You have your Bible, maybe, maybe you've gone through a hard week, you close your Bible for the week, you know, you've been out of fellowship for a while, you start hanging around the wrong folks, the wrong people, the wrong friends, and now your wife and your, you're having some problems, okay? You're having some conflict in the marriage covenant. And I've neglected worship. And guess what happens? You want relationship. You want love. You want affection. You want someone to talk to you, okay? Satan comes out, throws a hook, baited. It might look like a, fe- a Facebook friend request. It might look like an email in your email box. It may look like somebody showing up on your doorstep, okay? Now, you have a decision to make at that moment. What are you going to do with that thing? Are you going to accept it? Are you going to decline it, okay? Maybe money's your thing. Maybe gambling's your thing, okay? And somehow, this thing on the phone always pops up. Oh, I got a new gambling app. Here's a new gambling site. You can get $5,000 free. Your first $5,000 are free. By the way, nothing's free. Just, just saying. It's not free. It's not. What are you going to do? Are you going to download it? Or are you going to delete it? It's going to come. There's the lore. And all this stuff happens in an instant. In an instant. Here's the cycle, guys. Ready? Desire goes to deception goes to decision. It's always, always, always a decision. And the decision is this. Do you love God or Satan more? Do you love God or do you love yourself more? That's the decision that every temptation basically comes down to. Who do you love more? So last piece to the cycle is death. Desire Deception, decision, death. Verse 15. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Mm. Let that sink in for a second. It's like that lure. It looks so good. It looks like it's everything that you want it to be. And guess what happens? It looks like it produces freedom. It looks like it produces joy. And you know what it gives to you? It only produces death. Because why? There's a hook behind it. Satan's hook is behind it. And he wants to capture you with it. Death is birth. Okay? What is death? We think about all, always, when we think about death, we always think about physical death. Death, I've said it before, in your Bible, the word means separation. Okay? We die, the body and the spirit, they separate. When you die without Jesus Christ, what happens? There's a separation eternally from God's presence, God's love in a pl- real place called hell. Okay? Let me show you again. This is so practical every day. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is, this is in the streets of America today. It separates you. Watch this. Pornography will separate you and your marriage. Gossip will separate you from your friends. Gambling will separate you from your family. Anger will separate you from your good health. Drugs will separate you from your job. It will separate you from your lives. It will even separate you from your your so-called happiness and everything that you hold dear. Sin will separate things because it, James says, it produces death. It looks good, but it produces death. You want an example 
Again, you want to read something crazy? 2 Samuel chapter 11. We know David's story, right? David, man after God's own heart, sinned with Bathsheba, committed adultery, right? What happened afterwards? You read that story. Read 2 Samuel sometime. You want to talk about dysfunctional families? David had a dysfunctional family. There was rape, there was incest, there was murder, there was all kinds of crazy things happening. Why? Because of that one sin, it just produced, it just had this ripple effect in his family. Just whoo, like a tidal wave. Sin will produce death. Now, this is the most important part, guys. So you say, okay, this is the reality. We live in a fallen world. I, I work in temptation all the time, right? You might be saying that right now. Your place of work, you might just be saturated in it. You're like, how do I deal with this? Because let's be real. We go to school, we have temptation. We go to work, we have temptation. Everywhere there's a temptation. How do I fight this thing? How many have fought, fought this thing in their own flesh? You ever fight temptation in your own flesh? What happens when you fight temptation in your own flesh? How do you, how do you fare with that? Not, a whole, not real good. It's like quicksand, isn't it? You ever see those movies and those cartoons with quicksand? There's the guy stuck in the quicksand, and he's struggling. And what's that quicksand doing? It's sucking him down, sucking him down, sucking him down, sucking him down. It's not because he's not struggling. He's, not, he's fighting with all of his might, but he's getting, he's getting deeper and deeper, deeper. It's not because he's not struggling, but it's the nature of the environment that he's in that is pulling him down. So what do we do? James gives us three things. Briefly, if you want to summarize it in one word this morning, again, I'm a karate kid guy. I'll show you my age a little bit. Remember, remember uh, Daniel son? All right. Miyagi told him what? What did Miyagi tell him? He said, focus, Daniel son. Focus, 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 focus. James says, focus. What do you got to focus on? If you're going to beat temptation, what do you have to focus on? Number one, James says, don't you be deceived. God is still good. Don't be deceived. God is still good. Verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good and, per and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of light, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Oh, man. If you want to beat temptation... Just do this. Recall how good God has been to you. Recall the goodness of God in your life. And you know what happens when you do that, guys? That bait, that temptation starts to lose its luster. It starts to lose its shine. It starts to lose its appeal. Why do you want, like, having a beater car, right? And say, you know what, I'll, I'll take the beater car over the Lambo. No. Satan's offering you a beater car that's sort of dressed up real fancy. And God's saying, I want to give you the best. Don't forget, God is so good to you and to me. Perfect example is Joseph in the Old Testament. In the book of Genesis, it says that Joseph was a handsome man. He looked good. Okay? He was a stud. Potiphar's, Potiphar's wife had a thing for Joseph. And Potiphar's wife, day in and day out, hey, Joseph, come on, Joseph, come on, Joseph, come on, come on, Joseph. And this is what Joseph said. He said, how can I commit sin against God? He remembered how good God had been to him. He went from the pit. He remembered God's goodness and his faithfulness. He was in the prison, faithful. God is still good. And now he's being raised up and elevated. God has been so good to me to give me this position in this place. And how could I do this against God? God has been so good to me. He says here, James says, he's the father of lights. I like that. That means the celestial bodies. And you know, he says he doesn't change. You know, every, every day, the earth has a season of light and a season of darkness, right? Every day, it's, this, it's the rhythm. Now, is it, this, is it that the sun went away? No. 
The sun is still as bright, it's still as hot, it's still as shining as, as it ever was. What happens when things go into darkness? It is the earth rotating. And often we find times we find ourselves in darkness, we find ourselves in shadows, we find ourselves defeated by the enemy and by temptation. Why? Not because the sun moved, not because God moved, but because we moved away from God. Okay? He says, in temptation, don't run from God, run to God. Okay? Remember how good God has been to you. Second thing, he says, first of all, don't be deceived about God's goodness. Secondly, don't be, deceive, don't be deceived about God's truth. Verse 18. This whole verse here, you could make a whole... Verse 18 is powerful. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. We saw the temptation producing something, right? Death. Now we have God's word producing something. What is his word producing? It's life. It's life. In a world of deception, in a world of relativism, in a world of humanism, we need truth. Truth. Psalm 91 says, his truth shall be your shield and your buckler. How did Jesus beat temptation? How'd he do it? Matthew chapter 4, three temptations came Jesus' way. Satan said, Jesus, why don't you provide for yourself? You don't need God. Provide for yourself. Make them stones in the bread. Secondly, he said, hey, Jesus, why don't, you presume about, why don't you presume upon God's goodness and why don't you just cast yourself over here? He said the angels would guard you in all your ways, right, Jesus? Why don't you just do that, Jesus? And then the third one was, hey, let's pervert the plan of God. You don't need to go to the cross, Jesus. Why don't you take a deep or I'll give you all these kingdoms, right? And we can just avoid all that, Jesus. Hmm? How about that? And what did Jesus say? Hmm. It is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. And what did he quote? The book of Deuteronomy. And even as a pastor, I'll be honest with you, I don't have a lot of Deuteronomy hidden in my heart. I have a lot of John. I have a lot of Romans. I have a lot of Ephesians. I don't have a whole lot of Deuteronomy. We have to hide the word of God in our hearts, guys. You know, we love Bible studies as Christians, right? We have Bible studies on Wednesday, Bible studies on Tuesday, Bible studies. We have Bible studies everywhere with Christians. You know what we need to do as Christian believers? When temptation comes, you know what? You need to sit down and start to have a Bible study with the devil. Have a Bible study with the devil. Say, hey, you know what? Start quoting scripture to him. No, no, no. Greater is he that's in me than he who's in the world. No, I have weapons I can fight with. No, Jesus said he does love me. Fight. With this word. He says, don't forget how good God is. Don't forget the word of truth. And thirdly, if you want to beat temptation, listen to this. It's practical, guys. Don't forget who you are. Don't forget your position. James says in verse 18 that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. What's first fruit? First fruit is an Old Testament principle where basically the farmer... Basically, gave, if he had 10 acres, he would give the first acre to God, and he was trusting God then with the other nine acres. He said, okay, a harvest came up, I'm giving that to God, and God's going to provide for the rest of those nine acres. It was an act of faith on the believer's part. In essence, it was saying that God had a plan for that which he was yet to come up. And as believers in Jesus Christ, do you know and do not forget that God has a plan for you that has not manifested itself as of yet. Why? Because tomorrow isn't here yet. He has a plan for you tomorrow. He has a plan for you next month. He has a, God, if he doesn't, if he's very, God willing, he has a plan for you next year. Five years, 10 years, young people, 20 years, 30 years. Whatever God wills, don't forget God has a plan. Don't forget you are the first fruits. Give God first place in your life. Listen, first place in your life, and guess what? Trust Him to cover the rest. Trust Him to cover the rest. Don't forget who you are. You are a son. You are a daughter of King Jesus, bought with His precious blood. Don't forget that on this Independence Day, friends, as the fireworks are booming and the grills are going and the pools are rocking, don't forget you are a blood-bought child of Jesus Christ. You are free indeed. And you know what James tells us? He says, your dignity, and this is so big today, your dignity, your worth is not found in your gender. 
Your dignity, your net worth is not found in your education. It's not found in your race. It's not found in your bank account. It's not found in the job you have, the business you run, the titles that you obtain, the position that you hold. Your value, your worth is based solely on your relationship to Jesus Christ because everything that I just mentioned is going to eventually fade away and burn up. One thing won't. Your relationship to Jesus. Who are you? Don't forget when temptation comes your way, God is still good. Remember, God's word is still true. Remember who you are in Jesus Christ. And don't let the devil reduce you to a loaf of bread. Friends, as the worship team comes up here, I don't know where you're at today. I don't know if you're in quicksand. Maybe you're in quicksand today. You're like, I'm just fighting this thing, and I'm just, I'm just losing this battle today, guys. Maybe you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. The Bible says that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and that we all deserve death, separation. You cannot reconcile yourself back to God by coming to this church. You cannot reconcile yourself by doing good deeds. You can't reconcile yourself back to God by fasting and praying. There is one way to be reconciled back to God, and that's through the blood of Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Jesus did not give us the option of, hey, I'm just a good teacher. Because if, that, if that's so, he's not a good teacher because he said those words. Listen, we're talking about freedom this weekend. Are you, let me ask you one final question. Are you free today? Are you really, really, really free? Free from the bondage of sin. Free from the penalty of death. Free from the guilt. Free from the shame. Free from the law just hanging over your head like this. Listen, today could be the day where you are set free in Jesus Christ. As we this last song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. I invite you to come forward. Receive Jesus Christ. It's as simple as this, guys, saying, yes, I'm a sinner, and yes, I need a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, who died on the cross, who rose again on the third day, and who's resurrected and ascended back to the Father. Let's pray before we sing this song. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us victory in Jesus. You gave to us freedom in Jesus. And, Lord, we live in a world of temptation. We live in a world of trial. But, Lord, one thing we know for sure, you are still so good. Your grace is still amazing. Your mercy is still ever ceasing. And your freedom is forever liberating. In Jesus' name.